Hello everybody. Do you work with massive sensor, image, simulation, statistics data? And do you need fast, flexible and interoperable services on them? In this case, the big geodata standards or the Open Geospatial Consortium are your friends. In these webinars, we will explore the web coverage service ecosystem through practical use cases that will help you familiarize yourself with the system. My name is Peter Baumann. I'm the editor of the OGC coverage standards. And my name is Alex Dumitru. I'm a core developer of Rasdaman, which is the reference implementation to the web coverage service. So this is now web coverage service part three, data maintenance with WCST. Our learning goals for today are how to insert new coverages into some existing WCS offering, how can I update existing coverages, and how can I delete coverages from some offering. Prerequisites, as usual, a little bit HTTP and a little bit of XML. And yes, you should know about WCS Core. If not, why not look into our webinar on this? Anyway, here's a brief recap. The WCS suite altogether consists of WCS Core, which has a very focused task of giving access to multidimensional coverages or subsets thereof. Subsetting can be trimming, which retains the dimensionality or slicing, which reduces the dimensions. And the result that comes out of such an operation can be converted into a user-chosen format on the fly. Around this core, there is a number of extensions that provide functionality of assets which are optional to an implementer. That is, any tool provider may choose to implement a particular extension or leave it out. Finally, there are application profiles which allow for some domain-oriented bundling of the extensions. So for example, for Earth observation, that is remote sensing, or for MetOcean. Good. Now we look into a particular extension, and that is the one that is called transaction and that allows to modify coverage offerings on a server via web requests. This actually adds new request types. As you know from WCS Core, we have get capabilities, describe coverage, and get coverage. Now we add insert coverage, delete coverage, and update coverage. Actually, a core design goal was to keep all those request types compatible. It's always coverages that are floating around. So a get coverage result can immediately be piped into an insert coverage or update coverage request. Let's look at each request type in turn. First, insert coverage. That, as presented, allows to add a new coverage to some offering. And to this end, the input parameters are first and foremost the coverage. This coverage can be presented directly, well, not in a get KBP request like here on slide, but in a post or a SOAP request, for example. Alternatively, a URL can be provided, of which the server will evaluate and load. In this case, with a get KVP request, you see the request equals insert coverage, and below that, the coverage ref parameter which points to some location on the internet from which the server can load a hurricane.nc, so a netcdf file, and make a coverage out of it. Now there is an issue about the identifiers. We have to provide an identifier that is unique on the server, or in other words, that must not clash with an existing coverage. Sometimes we know that, and we can indicate a unique coverage identifier that will just be taken from the coverage presented. Sometimes, however, we don't know what identifier is available and we would like to shift that task to the server. That is done with a use ID parameter, which actually tells the server to generate a new identifier that is unique and assign it to the newly created coverage, obviously by ignoring the identifier provided with the coverage. In any case, the result of a successful insert coverage request will be this coverage identifier. So next one, delete coverage. We want to remove one or more existing coverage from a WCS. 
That means, by the way, that these coverages are dead and gone on the server and the coverage identifiers can be reused in future, for example. So the input is simply a list of coverage IDs that are doomed to removal and the request correspondingly looks very simple. We have a coverage ID parameter which contains one or more coverage identifiers, all of which will get deleted. So far, it was quite simple, wasn't it? It gets a little bit involved now with update coverage. And this is a reason why update coverage has been isolated in a particular conformance class. So a service implementer that wants to provide insert and delete functionality can still decide whether it also wants to provide update, which is a little bit more involved to implement. Let's look at it in detail. So we want to modify our coverage. That means we need several options because modifying can mean a lot of things. In particular, we want to have a selective update. I'll come back to, back to that, but first let's look at the general request. So we see here update coverage is what should be done. We have the identifier of the coverage to be modified on the server. And we have a reference to an input coverage, which again is a URL here. That actually means that the whole of coverage to be updated will be replaced by the contents of update.nc. So this is a complete replacement. What now if you want to do a partial replacement? Okay, in this case, we can specify a bounding box that indicates the area to be updated. So the input now is the identifier, the replacement values in the coverage, and a trim or slice bounding box to determine the target location where these new values should go in the coverage on the server. So the initial part looks the same as before, but now we have an extra subset parameter set here. That is identical in its syntax to what is available in the get coverage request. So we have subset equals, then the axis name, and then in parentheses the coordinates telling us where to update. So this refers to the target coverage, and in this case latitude ranges from 5 to 10, so this is a trim interval, and uh, age, so height, we want to take the level 0, and so that is a slice request. That would allow us, in this case, for example, to have something that is a one-dimensional coverage, so only latitude extent, that goes into a particular place on a coverage on the server, which obviously has at least latitude and height, probably also longitude. Okay, this way, actually, we can piecewise construct a larger coverage from smaller components from individual files. So far, so good. But sometimes we don't want bounding boxes. We need to have some more general shape. In this case, masking is our friend. We can pass a binary mask, which indicates which cells should be updated. This mask must have the same size as the input coverage because it points for each pixel to does it have to be replaced or is the original value on the server unchanged. Therefore, as input, we have not only the coverage ID and the replacement coverage, but in addition, the mask that tells us where to update. Technically, this mask again can be provided directly as a parameter or as a reference, like in the example below, where the server then will fetch the mask from the location given by the mask ref parameter. This allows us to be quite versatile when it comes to updating geometrically, that is on the domain set. But there is more to it. Sometimes we want to selectively update particular range components, so bands or channels or variables, whatever you may call it. That actually needs us to indicate the names of the range components to be updated. And by the way, Mm, the range components may be named differently, so we need to have a mapping of input range component names to the output range component names. Let's look at an example. It's all as before. We have a coverage ID and we have an input coverage by reference, and we have a parameter range component. This now tells us for each band that it should be replaced and by what it should be replaced. So, for example, the input component red should go into band 4 in the server com, uh, coverage. 
input component green should go into band three on the server and input component blue should be mapped to band two in the server coverage. So for example, this could resemble a case where we take an RGB image and we want to update a hyperspectral band, hyperspectral coverage on the server. Okay, now actually we can do quite a lot of things and let me underline that all these options can be combined. So you do not have only the joists as we have seen it here, uh, but you can combine all these mechanisms in one update coverage request. This is quite useful because with one request, obviously you can update uh, coverage on the server, but in practice, you may have more coverages. You may have thousands of uh, input files that should go into one or more coverages. To this end, we found it quite useful to have some way to um, support automatic ingestion and also incremental coverage assembly. That is where the recipe concept comes in that we have built on top of, on top of WCST. This, by the way, is implemented as part of the Rusterman toolkit. It's, however, not tied to any particular implementation as it uses WCST as an interface, so it can be used in any environment. So what you can do with it, for example, is you take a set of 2D images somewhere sitting in files or coming in one by one, and you want to compose them into a single large seamless map, so a 2D coverage. Or you take another set of 2D images and put them together into a 3D time series data cube. All of that is possible with two core concepts. Number one, the recipe, which is, say, a data schema or a data mapping schema. So that tells how input files are mapped and are shifted to their particular position in some larger coverage. And it defines the coverage on the server, what this should be in terms of dimensions, etc. This is parameterized, and so-called ingredients are parameter values that can fine-tune such a recipe and streamline it for a particular situation. So here you can tell where to ingest and which files and what other directory conventions, sometimes file names contain uh, coordinates and other stuff. So all of that can be specified here. That is actually so flexibly and convenient that we use that ourselves now all the time and it allows us to have reproducible ingestion procedures and it also allows to share the, uh, share the recipes across machines or even across institutions. So somebody may have a nice recipe for ingesting Landsat images and says to another institution, hey, here you can have my recipe, you just need to change some ingredients that are specific for your installation, and then you can run and establish a Landsat time series data cube. Also, this is extensible. There are developer tools coming along, and there is Python support opening up all the world of Python tools available. There are nasty situations in practice that also are catered for. So there are solutions for incomplete metadata, for misalignment of data, etc. All those things that make our life difficult. And all GDAL file types supported? Well, because we use GDAL internally. Okay, this is not standardized. I would like to mention that again. But maybe people get interested and at some time it might become part of the WCST standard. Who knows? But first, now I would call Alex to show us how WCST works in a hands-on situation. So Alex, can you please guide us through that? Now that you have seen what the WCST standard is capable of, let's see how to apply it in practice using some real-world use cases. In this webinar, I will be assuming that you have watched the WCS Core webinar already and that you are familiarized with the basics behind the web coverage service. So let's get started. We'll first try to insert a simple coverage into the web service. I have a coverage here encoded into a GML format. It's a pretty simple coverage uh, with limit, a limited amount of data encoded here as a tuple list some metadata like the envelope, the rectified grid, and the range fields. 
So let's try to insert it. To do this, we have to issue a WCS insert request, which is quite simple to do. As usual, we will be adding the service, the value WCS and version parameters. In this case, it's 2.0.1. And the request type, in this case, is uh, insert coverage. We also have to specify the coverage that we want to insert through the coverage ref parameter. In this case, we will be giving it a URL to the coverage that we want to insert. So in our case, it's localhost slash mycov.xml. And that is all that you need to do to insert this coverage here. Let's run the request and see what happens. And as you can see, I got back an XML response that tells me that the coverage, with the coverage ID, my coverage was inserted. So everything was fine. Okay, what if the coverage, call my coverage already existed, or if I'm not sure if uh, coverage with the name uh, written here in the GML document exists already? Well, I can use the parameter use ID, which has two values, either existing, which is the default one, and it would take the ID in the GML, which it already tested, and new, which generates a new coverage ID and uh, just ignores the one existing in the document if it exists. So let's try with this value as well and run the request and as you can see I've inserted the coverage again and now uh, with the coverage ID WCST and some uh, UID uh, 16 string we can check that the coverages exist by running a get capabilities request first Here, get capabilities. That's all. Let's run it and look at the contents. As, as and as you can see, the coverage, all my coverage, was inserted in the one for which we generated an ID, WCST underline some random uh, digits here, was inserted as well. We can look to see how the my coverage looks like in the in the endpoint and I can run a describe coverage request with the coverage ID called my coverage I will run the request and as you can see we have the my coverage uh, coverage in Gmail format here with the same range types same envelope and I think we could get a get coverage as well to check the data as well. And it should be the same as this one. So 119, 208, 248. As you can see, pretty much the exact uh, contents of the one that we ingested. Okay, but you might think that you have large coverages and you do not want to represent the contents of the coverage, the data that it is holding in a top list format because it would occupy a large amount of uh, this space and it would be harder to process than a binary format. Well, WCST allows you to use such a binary format inside the coverage. And I have a coverage that uh, exemplifies this use case and it's called coverage with ref data.gml. Let's open it. And as you can see, it has a GML ID, so it's wax. This is, will be the coverage ID of the new coverage that will be ingested. The same metadata as before. 
but uh, now there is no top list element here as it was in the previous coverage but instead we have a gml file reference uh, element that contains a url to the file containing the data of this coverage in this case this is a local file to the endpoint uh, tiff in the, the tiff format and the url is using the file protocol however this could be done using http ftp or any other uh, standard web protocol to transfer the data so let's see how uh, how this coverage will be inserted let's copy the url here let's go back to the service and modify the request here we want an insert coverage request we want the coverage ref to be the coverage with ref data.gml and uh, we won't be using a different id we'll be using the one inside the coverage so i won't specify the use id parameter and now let's run the request and see what happens and after a bit of time because now we have to insert a larger amount of data i got back again a coverage id called wax so the the coverage was inserted correctly let's check the contents of the new coverage i'll do a get coverage request and now the coverage id will be wax and i want it as a image tiff format so that i can compare it with the one referenced in the given coverage so let's see how this uh, looks like i will just run the request using wget and let's put it between quotes so there's no error and i run the request let's open it with an image viewer and as you can see it's a TIFF image containing this uh, lake somewhere in Florida let's open uh, the the one reference in the coverage as well and let's see how it was called I think it was yeah, Vargio data okay I just copy it here and open it and as you can see the same picture so the data was preserved and decoded from the GeoTIFF format into a coverage format giving us some flexibility in the way we encode data and in the way we transfer it across the network so that's pretty much all you have to know about uh, the insert uh, request insert coverage request of the WCST standard so we've learned how to insert a coverage let's now learn how to update a coverage and for this we can use the update coverage request type of the WCST extension the update coverage request can either modify the data of a coverage by replacing it with the contents of another coverage or by extending the bounding box of an existing coverage with uh, a given amount of coordinates and at the same time adding the data concatenating the data of the given coverage with the existing one 
Let's first try the most basic example and just replace the data of an existing coverage with a given coverage. And I have here uh, the original coverage that we introduced and we have this file here that contain the data Wax Lake 1 I have a different uh, coverage still in JML format with the only difference that it has a Wax Lake 3 file here the metadata is exactly the same as the previous file so let's try to update it to do this we have to change the request type from insert coverage to update coverage uh, we need to specify a coverage ID so this is the coverage that we will be updating and in this case it's called wax and then we have to give an input coverage ref and this will be the URL to the coverage that we want to replace the existing one. I'll just copy it from here. And we can run the request now. As you can see, we got back an empty response, meaning that there was no error in processing the request and that the data was updated. To check this, we can look uh, at the data of the coverage and let's go back to the console. So this was the original one and let's do a get coverage and see the old one, uh, the new one and we can use the same request so I'm getting the wax coverage here and let's save it to a more meaningful name let's say wax update .tif. so I'm running the request and I already got back the response I can see them here I have the wax update tiff and the original one and let's open the update and as you can see it's a totally different picture so the data was changed uh, and was replaced with the data contained in the input coverage we can also use the update request to extend existing coverages in areas where no data was defined or to uh, pinpoint the exact update by specifying the coordinates and the area of interest through specifying the coordinates of a bounding box and to exemplify this feature we will be doing a common use case by uh, uh, tying up four images a different coordinate so let's see how this works I'll just clean the environment here and go to bar geodata wax lake where I have four images and let's take a look at them so these are the four images that together form a bigger image and the coordinates line up nicely for example let's look at wax lake one the teeth you can see the upper left corner uh, the lower left corner and the upper left corner and looking at wax lake 2 the teeth you can see that it's the image uh, to the left of the previous one so they are nicely aligned okay so with this in mind let's try to create one coverage out of these four satellite images and I'll use the existing wax coverage that I already inserted and do four updates because I have four images and I'll specify for each one the exact coordinates at which it should be placed so let's look at the 
GML encoded coverages and uh, each one is called Wax1. So Wax1.gml is this one and corresponds to the Wax Lake 1 TIFF. Then I will have Wax2.gml which corresponds to the uh, upper right corner. Wax3 is the lower left corner and Wax4 is the lower right corner. So with this in mind, let's update the coverage. And the first thing, uh, I will add the Wax1 coverage here as an input coverage reference. But I want now to specify the exact position where it is supposed to be placed. Without specifying the position, it just replaces uh, the data in the whole uh, existing coverage. Now I can tell it which part of the existing coverage I want to replace. And I have some subsets here uh, that I collected already using the GDAL info and on the easting axis we have these values and on the norting axis we have another set of values so as you can see we can use the subset parameter to specify to define a bounding box uh, on each dimension where the new slice should be added so let's run this first request and it seemed to work correctly let's run one more request and see what we get back so let's do wax2.gml and again I will do the subsets I will copy the subsets that I already have And again on the norting axis should be pretty similar. Okay, I run this request as well, and this one succeeded as well. So now I have uh, two coverages merged into one, and let's see how it looks for the moment. Let's go back to the documents folder and let's run a get coverage request. I had one here and let's say wax uh, merged. Again the same coverage ID wax. So let's look at it. And as you can see we have two parts. The original one looked like this. And now we have a larger image formed by the concatenation of two existing coverages. Shop and add the other two parts. And I'll do the same with wax3.gml. Again, I'll add the subsets. First, the easting axis and then the norting one. Oops. So the norting one. Let's run this request as well. Should be pretty fast. And the last one, wax4 dot gml. And again, we should set up the correct coordinates. So let's copy it from the GDAL info output. First testing and again norting. Okay, let's run this last request. And it succeeded. And let's look at the get coverage now again. Let's save it in wax final. Okay. 
as you can see it's a full image this is what we started with of a picture of 1200 pixels by 1200 and now we have a pictures of a picture of 2400 pixels by 2400 describing a larger area and created by updating the first coverage and updating the upper left corner of uh, our desired coverage with the other three corners. As you can see this is a powerful method of creating larger coverages from uh, smaller parts of information encoded as a coverage. So for example you could create 2D mosaic maps using this method or you could create 3D time series or uh, let's say 4D out of 3D cubes depending on your file formats and your coverage dimension ality. One last thing that I will show you with regards to the WCST standard is how to sometimes uh, fit a coverage that does not have the exact metadata that you'd expect with an existing coverage. Specifically, if you have a, an input coverage uh, containing different band names than the existing coverage, uh, there is a method in WCST that allows you to uh, map them. So let's see how to do this. First, I created a fake coverage called Wax5 that contains uh, an empty TIFF, as the name suggests, it's just a blank image, all white, so that we can see it uh, afterwards in the get coverage request. And I changed the names to band red, band green, and uh, band blue. If you remember in the initial one, I can show it to you, they were called red, green, and blue. So to be able to update this existing coverage with the coverage with different band names, we can use the range subset parameter and I will update this request here from wax4, I will do a wax5 and I will add the range component parameter and the syntax of this one is the band of the input coverage so the first band was called I think band underline red and I want it to be mapped to the red band or range type of the existing coverage. I'll do the same for band green goes to green and band blue goes to blue. And that is all that you have to do. Now the two coverages will be compatible and the WCS server will know how to handle this uh, band name mismatch. So let's send a request and again we got back an empty response which means our uh, request worked and let's see uh, what we get back so we can run the get coverage request once again let's say wax range here the tiff and as you can see here in the image now I get a white corner here meaning that the update was successful and that the bands were uh, matched successfully. So that's pretty much all you need to know about the insert coverage and update coverage uh, request types of the WCST extension. Now, to showcase the flexibility and power that the WCST extension offers in terms of data ingestion, I will show you how to work with an application called WCST Import, which is based on the standard and it is used to import large amounts of data into a WCS endpoint. This tool offers you the possibility of creating complex coverages like 4D climate data or 3D time series out of existing data sets that are not necessarily of the same dimensionality or in a coverage compatible format 
like GML or GeoTIFF or in SCDF and etc. What this means in layman terms is that out of a set of 2D satellite images over the same area, you could choose to create a 3D coverage with a time axis. You could also create a 4D coverage of climate data from a 3D NetCDF dataset with, uh, let's say, northing, easting and altitude axis and augment it with a time axis. So it gives you a large amount of flexibility on how you want to model the data that you have and allows you to create complex coverages uh, using the WCST standard. So let's start with a simple example and insert a couple of satellite images to form a 2D coverage. So I'll switch to this console here and I'm in the Waxlate directory which contains the four TIFFs that uh, we've used to insert uh, into the WCS endpoint uh, previously. As you remember, we did uh, in one insert request and three update requests in order to create the full coverage. And this is very nice if you're a developer or uh, an application that imports data, but if you're a researcher or a data center administrator, you might not want to do the HTTP requests yourself for each file, especially if you have 10,000 files. So you might want an application that does this. After work, WCST is targeted uh, towards uh, development uh, practices and towards building ecosystems around it. So uh, we want to do this as simple as possible and we can use this WCST, uh, WCST import application that basically creates the request for us. And let's see how it does this. We can look at this JSON file. Uh, we call it an ingredients file and you'll see in a moment why. And we can see it has three main uh, sections, config, input and recipe. The config uh, section contains, let's say, global parameters like the service URL, basically the endpoint of the WCS service, a temporary directory where it can store some intermediary files, a CRS resolver that is used to read information regarding the CRS of the dataset, for example, getting the access names and things like this, a default CRS in case your dataset does not have a CRS that is readable. Uh, this mock parameter allows you to first test the request, see what requests the application might do without actually issuing them. And then we have an automated uh, config parameter that allows you to ingest data without any human input. The third, uh, the second uh, section, input, allows you to specify a coverage ID name and uh, let's change it because I think I created the coverage called wax and let's see wax test and then a paths uh, element where you can uh, list the files that you want to import either directly as file paths or as a regular expression like I have here which basically tells uh, the application to get any file that has a TIFF extension from the current directory or you could even list URLs to get them over the internet. The third section, recipe, is the most important one because uh, it tells the application how to model the data. So as I said in the beginning, from these 2D images you could create a time series, so a 3D coverage, or you could create a map, which is a 2D coverage. The recipe is just tell the application the model that you want. And in this case, we will want a map uh, out of the files. And we can choose this recipe called map mosaic, which tries to fit on a 2D plane the files that you give it. We also have some extra options that can be used uh, uh, by the application uh, to work a bit with the data. For example, I can tell it to tile it 
in smaller parts or uh, I could for example tell it to import it to import it into WMS as well if that is possible but we don't need this we can just remove them because we are focusing on the WCS part so that's pretty much all that you have to do in the ingredients file and what is nice about this uh, ingredient file is that you could uh, distribute it with the data you want to send the data to one of your co-workers or to a different institution you do not have to give them some uh, instructions on how to ingest the data and how to model it to obtain the same results that you did you can just add this JSON file and that is all that is needed for them to ingest the data and have the same exact model that you have and as WCST is a tra uh, uses transactions to insert the data, it, pre it is pretty much guaranteed that your data will always be the same on all the computers and on all the machines that you are using. So let's try to insert it. And as you remember, I had the, the mock parameter set to true. So it will not actually insert it. Let's use another tab for this. Let's do WCST import and the path to the JSON file. So I can run this and I already get some feedback. It says that it collected these files, what's like one, two, three, and four. The TIFF based on the regular expression that I've given, that the recipe that I've chosen is map mosaic, the coverage that will be created will be called wax test and it will be an insert operation so it does not update an existing one with the data uh, and again mocked true so it will just show the requests the WCST request that it would do and not actually import it and it already ran and as you can see it created some GML files out of uh, uh, the T files which only contain the metadata and uh, it issues the it uh, shows the requests that it would issue and we have an insert coverage then an update coverage for each one of the slices so that's pretty simple let's actually ingest it and we have to change the mock parameters mock parameter to false And let's run the command again. And as you can see, now mocked is false, so it will actually insert the data. You don't see the uh, requests anymore because it's not running in sort of debug mode. And as you can see, the recipe was executed successfully. Let's check it out. And uh, we can use the WCS client for this. So let's look, it was called wax test and I can see it here. And let's retrieve the coverage as a TIFF so we can look at it. Let's download it. And it's exactly what we expected the same uh, picture as before when we did all this manually so as you can see this uh, application can save you quite a bit of time and it's uh, it's quite useful for administrators for developers and for researchers that want to have a, a good way of ingesting the data a reliable and reproducible method Okay, let's see how, how else we could uh, import the data. And I'll go back uh, to the console. Let's move the browser out of the way. Okay, and I'm back into the console. And let's go to a different folder. It's called regular. And here again I have some T files 
that have the same geographical bounding box uh, but are taken at different points in time. So we want to model this as a 3D coverage that is a time series and on the time axis we want the slices to be equally spaced. So we would want a regular axis uh, as a time axis. So let's look at the ingredients file to see how we can do this. And I'll open the JSON file here and you'll see that the config is exactly the same as in the previous one. Now the coverage ID, let's call it aerosol test. The paths again, we want all the TIFFs, uh, TIFF files from the current directory, so no change as well. And now the recipe, we want, as I said, the regular coverage, time series coverage. So I will create, uh, I will use the, reg the time series regular recipe. And this recipe requires some options in order to construct the coverage because uh, it does not have a method to extract them from the files as this, these are 2D files, they do not have any time indication whatsoever. So uh, it requires a time start, in this case is the 4th of January 2012. The time format, if it's a valid ANSI date or some uh, more common date, you can just use auto and it will try to guess it, otherwise you can uh, enter a time format here. The time CRS, so you'll need uh, the CRS for the time axis, and in this case I will be choosing an ANSI date CRS, and the space between the slices. In this case I will choose 30 days, as this is the information I have from the provider of the date. Again, timing is not important, it's just an internal Thing, you can leave it or take it out. Seriously. So let's try to ingest it. And again, we will do WCST import. And it uh, tells us that the recipe has been validated. And the coverage will be called aerosol test. It will be inserted. It will not be mocked. So uh, it will actually insert the data and this recipe is a bit nicer than the previous one it analyzes some of the files first and it says that five files have been analyzes, uh, analyzed you can check the time step uh, that was generated for it to check if it is correct as you remember we had a time step of 30 days starting at 4th of January and then you get the 3rd of uh, February, then the 4th of March, and so on. So it looks good to me. I can proceed with the import. And now it runs the WCST requests, and after some time, it was quite fast, it tells me that, okay, it was successfully executed, and we can check it in the WCS client. Let's find the browser here. I'll go to get capabilities, run it, okay, and I see it here in the salt test. And as you can see, it's a time series coverage. It has an easting with the domain extent, the northing axis with its domain extent, and the ANSI axis. And as I've chosen uh, the CRS for the time axis as ANSI date, it will measure uh, time as the number of days uh, with the datum origin being the 1st of January 1600s. So there are 150 days, 50,000 days from there until the starting day that we have chosen. So that's pretty much it for the regular coverage, regular time series recipe. And let's look at one more recipe, uh, time series irregular. And let's go to a different folder containing the data for an irregular time series. i just called it irregular. Let's see what it contains. So as you can see, I have a couple of TIFF files here that again have the same geographical bounding box, but different dates uh, at which the images were taken. And I now want, it, want to insert them 
as a coverage but with irregular spacing between the slices. So for example we can see from the file name here that this picture, this image was taken at 1st of February 2011 at 12.50, the next one was taken on 2nd of February at 12, the next one on on 3rd of February 12.40 so as you can see they are pretty random spaced uh, in time so to insert it as a time series and be able to anal analyze it using WCS or WCPS I can use a irregular time series irregular recipe and let's look again at the ingredients file and the config stays pretty much the same the coverage ID, let's name it something more let's just say snow cover and again I want all the tips from the folder, nothing special here and now I want to use the time series irregular recipe which will put the slices one on top of the other and has to uh, did deduce the spacing between the slices from the timestamps that each slice has. Okay, so the options require the time parameter. Basically, the application asks you how it should retrieve the uh, the date time of each slice. It can do this either by looking at the file name, and in this case, uh, we will be using this one. Uh, and you have to provide it with a regular expression that can extract the date time from it. You have to specify the format as well. As you remember, it was year, month, day, hours, minutes with no spacing between them. So you can be quite flexible and accept all kind of date formats that you might encounter. There are also other uh, methods of extracting the date time. For example, if it is a GeoTIFF or a NetCDF, it could extract it from a TIFF tag or from a netcdf variable and it has this option as well. So it's quite flexible in the method of uh, reading the date time. Again, the time CRS, we are using ANSI date because it's quite common and quite well tested. Tiling again doesn't matter, so let's just save it and try to import it. And again, it tells me all the files that it has collected. It tells me that the recipe is time series irregular, the coverage will be named snow cover. It is an insert operation. It won't be mocked, so the insert will actually happen. And again, this recipe analyzes the data beforehand and uh, lets me confirm that everything is okay. And in this case, let's check for this one is 2011, uh, 1st of January, and I can see it here. Uh, and for the second one, the same. I can check it so everything looks fine to me. Let's just import it. And after a bit of time, it will issue all the requests and uh, tell us that the recipe has executed successfully. So this gives you a very nice method of uh, inserting time series, uh, irregular time series from 2D slices that are not equally spaced in time. I will only show you these three recipes for now. You can create your own recipes if you have a different uh, model that you are using in your institution. Maybe you are doing some 5D uh, coverage models. It's quite easy to extend this application. It's written in Python, so most people are familiar with the language and uh, to extend it and add a new recipe you just have to extend one class and that's uh, that uh, basically tells the application how to do the model. So as you can see, the WCST extension is powerful enough to allow applications like this one to ingest the data from various formats, uh, various degrees uh, 
of metadata completeness and uh, various levels of dimensionality into a coverage of your choosing. It is also very nice that you can send the ingredients file along with the data and you should uh, keep this in mind that it will it can help you quite a bit to reduce all the errors from uh, uh, using instructions to actually import your data. So that's pretty much it for the WCST uh, extension and the WCST import application and I hope you can now ingest data more easily into, into WCS endpoints. Okay, thanks Alex. So let's summarize. We have seen WCST in its version 2.0 that is currently out for adoption and I believe by the end of 2015 this will be an op adopted OGC standard. WCST allows to have web-based maintenance of WCS offerings and is such uh, therefore complementing the retrieval extensions. To this end, we have insert, update and delete requests uh, which allow us to modify service offerings. In particular, the update is quite versatile. We can do updating by bounding box, by mask, by range components, and we can pass coverages directly in a request or by reference through a URL. So much about the standard part. Then we have seen a Rasterman specific tool, which however, as it relies only on WCST, can be used in any environment. It's recipes that allow for configurable mass upload and maintenance of coverages through file-based input. Maybe at some time this will become a part of WCST, for example, version 2.1. Who knows? If you want to proceed, then we would recommend to you another webinar that introduces you to WCPS, the OGC GeoRaster query language. For now, thanks for bearing with us and see you later.